My guest today is Ryan P. Lowry, a 2014 national champion baseball player, earned his BS and MS in exercise physiology and exercise and nutrition science from the University of Tampa. Ryan is currently the president of the Applied Science and Performance Institute and is finishing his PhD in health and human performance. Over his career, Ryan has published over 100 papers, abstracts, and book chapters on human performance and sports nutrition, and is rapidly becoming one of the premier sports scientists in the nation. Ryan has received awards for the Exercise Science Scholar of the Year, NSCA's Outstanding Presentation of the Year, and most recently, the National Exercise Science Major of the Year. In addition to his outstanding academic and research accomplishments, Ryan is one of the most sought-after nutrition and supplement formulators in the industry, and recently launched his new book, The Ketogenic Bible, along with his business partner, Dr. Jacob Wilson. Ryan, really appreciate you taking the time out today. Hey, Dr. Bubs. Hey, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on. Fantastic. Well, Ryan, we met briefly at uh, ISSN in, uh, in 2015, and I really enjoyed your talk with uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson on ketogenic diets. So it's, it's fantastic to have you on the show now. To, uh, you guys have just released the Ketogenic Bible, Authoritative Guide to Ketosis. So uh, can you tell folks you know, what inspired you to write the book? Yeah, you know, I think right now, it, more than ever, I think more people are becoming aware of this concept of ketosis and ketogenic diets, and it's literally exploded. Uh, it actually just surpassed like paleo on Google search terms. So it's, it's it getting bigger than ever, and I think one of the things that we wanted to do was kind of disseminate through a lot of that information and provide one resource where people can go to to get high quality information but that's easily understood by the masses like taking complex scientific topics but breaking it down so that anyone can utilize it fantastic and if we sort of kick things off by getting all the listeners on the same page here whether they're docs trainers nutritionists athletes you know anyone trying to improve their health who's listening in can you give us a definition of a ketogenic diet and what the being in a state of ketosis really means yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the easiest way to describe it is a higher fat, low carbohydrate, moderate protein diet that really shifts your body from primarily utilizing glucose and carbohydrates as fuel to running off of fats and ketones. Um, that's basically it in a, the simplest terms. Fantastic. And when someone be, you know enters a state of ketosis, you know they they shift over to burning primarily fat as a fuel source, correct? Yep, absolutely. And and you see an elevation in these unique molecules co called ketone bodies. So our body has two fuel sources. Uh, it can utilize glucose, which comes from like carbohydrates, or ketones, uh, which can come from breaking down bodily fat or even dietary fat. And this whole alternative source of ketones is what really drives ketosis. And of course, this term often gets confused with ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis. And so can you clarify here in terms of this, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, why would it have been beneficial for us to enter this state of ketosis, you know, in times of food scarcity, et cetera? And how is it different from, from what uh, type 2 diabetics might experience? Yes, big time. And I think that's a huge, huge uh, misinterpretation. A lot of people hear the word ketosis, especially doctors We'll hear it and go, oh my gosh, that's, that's bad. Like We've been taught that this ketosis thing is dangerous. Well, like you said, that's ketoacidosis, and that, that it really only happens in diabetics. And that's when you still have an elevated level of glucose. Um, your pH drops significantly because you have so many ketones being produced in your body. But to put it in perspective, people who are on like a ketogenic diet or a low-carbohydrate diet or even fasting – you might see blood millimoles of ketones go for anywhere from 0.5 millimoles up to maybe like the highest we've seen is like five millimoles. And that's really, really high. But someone who's like ketoacidotic, you're talking about 18, 20, 25 millimoles in their blood. So it's a completely different state than what we traditionally refer to as like ketosis or nutritional ketosis. And of course, you know, very well said. And of course, during times of food scarcity, this idea of being able for the brain to be able to fuel itself, because obviously the brain runs on glucose, but in times of, of depleted glucose, this is where the ketones stepped in, correct? Exactly. And, and our brains, actually, there's data to indicate our brains prefer ketones over glucose. And, and a lot of our tissues can take up 
and utilize it. Nearly every tissue in the body can utilize uh, ketones as fuel. There's a couple that that can't, and our body can readily produce the glucose that it needs on its own. But most of the most of the cells in the body can utilize ketones as fuel, and the brain loves it. The hearts love ketones, and our muscles readily take up and utilize ketones as well. Fantastic. Well, I know the ketogenic diet is obviously really popular right now, as you already mentioned. So let's talk weight loss. You know, why is the ketogenic diet, uh, you know, an effective strategy for weight loss? Yeah, and I think there's a couple different reasons. Uh, a lot of people go into this um, and go, "Hey, I'm going to jump on a ketogenic diet because they see profound weight loss effects very early on." Um, and the ketogenic, when you kind of embark on a ketogenic diet, people can lose weight very fast, very, very rapidly. And the thing is, early on, some of that can definitely be like what we call glycogen or the stored form of carbohydrates. That's being depleted, so of course you're going to lose weight. But over time, what we're seeing is that individuals who are on a ketogenic diet, by lowering your carbohydrate intake, you don't have all of these peaks and valleys and, and getting a huge insulin response from eating a ton of carbohydrates and a ton of sugar. And over time, your body adapts to primarily utilizing fat as fuel. So by doing that, you increase something known as fat oxidation. And so you're constantly burning fat throughout the entire day, which can over time lead to a ton of great benefits, not only in body composition, but uh, a lot of other great benefits as well. And of course, in, in terms of weight loss, one of the things I tend to emphasize a lot with my clients is this idea of getting back to eating real food and being intuitive mm -hmm. with how people eat. And of course, you know, as I've heard you mention, calories always matter. But on a ketogenic diet, you know, without having to focus on calories, clients often end up in a caloric deficit. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? A hundred percent. And I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the things that I, that I talk about very a, a long a lot of times is the ketogenic diet. What I feel is truly amazing about it is it puts appetite back in the individual's control. And I think as a society and where we're at, we've kind of gone away from that. We've lost it where we have food so readily available and people tend to go, oh, well, it's simple. Just eat less and move more. And my comment is like, if it was that easy, then, then a lot of people would be in a lot different situations, but it's not that simple. And I think by allowing people to get back into control like you said, eating whole foods, um, not not just snacking all day, it really can help affect their appetite to a way where they're now aware of what they're eating, they're aware of how much they're eating, and they're not overeating and snacking all the time. And snacking definitely plays a massive, massive role, as you mentioned there. I, you know, I recently had um, Dr. Stefan Guillenet on, and he you know, mentioned how the brain is so hardwired for all these hyperpalatable foods that are around us. And you know, of course, a typical breakfast of orange juice and cereal and some of these things have everyone feeling peckish and snacking at mid mid morning. And so the you know the keto diet is tremendous for satiety as well. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah, so it it really is, and a lot of people it depends on their approach. But like for instance, I take a intermittent fasting approach, or I like to call it intermittent eating because a lot of people are scared of the f word, the fasting word. Yeah, but for sure. I call it, I call it intermittent eating, but. Um, one of the things that I found personally is I was always one of those guys who for a long time would eat eight meals a day and would constantly be snacking on granola bars and just riding that roller coaster of ups and downs and needed to just kind of replenish carbohydrates all the time to kind of stay up. But with the ketogenic diet, um, because you're readily producing ketones from the fat sources that you eat and even your own body fat is ketones can kind of keep that satiation or that satiety high for a very long period of time. And I think that's one of the most incredible pieces of it is people are able to go hours without eating and feel completely fine. They don't get the, what we refer to as like the hangry response. They don't get that because there's a fuel source that they readily have available that they're able to take up and utilize to prevent them from needing to go to the cupboard to go get a snack. Absolutely. And I think that's something that in the you know, traditional medical system, we've done a poor job of uh, you know, convincing everyone they do need to eat every three or four hours or else everyone's just going to sort of collapse. Um, mm -hmm. And I can definitely relate to what you mentioned there. I've always, you know, especially in 
playing sport in, in high school and in college of just having to eat all the time. And if I didn't eat, then it was, you know, energy levels and focus would really sort of suffer. Um, so that's a really great comment there. Now, what about if people are jumping into this or trainers, nutritionists who might recommend this to their clients? Is there an adaptation period? You know, is the keto flu for real? Yes, it's, it's definitely for real. Um, and that's something to just be very open and honest with people who are doing it. And the best way I explain it to people is this. It doesn't matter if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. I say, for instance, take someone who's 30. I said, for 30 years of your life, You've primarily uh, relied on one fuel source, and that's glucose, to kind of you to go about your daily activities. Don't think that in two days that your body's just going to be able to miraculously be really efficient, utilizing ketones, be an extreme fat burner. I say it's going to take some time. Um, and we see adaptations, what we call the keto adaptation period. People can say it can take a week, two weeks. I'd honestly tell people to get, if you're going to do it, it's not really a ketogenic diet. Make it a ketogenic lifestyle. Jump in and commit to a month, two months, three months. Fight through that adaptation period because you really will start seeing the the adaptation start taking place months to even years out from starting to lower your carbohydrate intake. And I think that's really important to, to just be open with people about is that there is a period where you might feel like, whoa, what is this? Like I have headaches, I'm tired, I'm groggy. Well, your body's switching to completely to utilizing a different fuel source. It's going to take some time, but at the end of that tunnel, uh, it's completely different. And so battling through that period, there's ways to get through it, but battling through that period is, is very, very important. Absolutely. And any strategies that you like that can help to buffer that transition period that you've seen in, in, in your clients or in the lab? Yeah, so we've actually done some studies finding out, like, are there ways you can speed that? Is there, is there ways that you can speed that adaptation process? One of the things is a lot of people go into it, they feel horrible, and they're like, you know what, I'm just not going to work out. I'm going to take it easy. I'll just, it'll, it'll be, go away in a couple days. But actually what we found is if you do the opposite, if you power through and you have, like, some of your hardest workouts, um, specifically, like, high-intensity interval training, um, during that time, you can deplete glycogen levels pretty fast with uh, high intensity interval training. The faster you can deplete your glycogen levels, the quicker your body can start converting over and primarily utilizing fat uh, as fuel. So one step, one recommendation is to power through uh, your workouts and continue to work out very hard. The other one is electrolyte supplementation. Um, and I'm, I think there's a huge need for that during the adaptation period. People are still, unfortunately, afraid of like um, high amounts of sodium. But during this adaptation period, having like extra salt and salting your foods can be extremely helpful, along with like potassium and magnesium to help replenish those electrolytes that because your insulin's lower, you're excreting these out at a much more rapid rate. So you need to replenish them even more so. Yeah, that's a great point. I recently had uh, Dr. James DiNicola Antonio on talking all about salt. And of course, yeah, on low-carb diets and keto diets, um, everyone's so programmed to, to, to avoid salt that it's definitely something that will have a big impact. So it's good to know that you know, electrolytes and intense training are a great way to kind of transition that, that, that adaptation period. Now, a question that I get asked a lot by clients who are going to engage into this keto lifestyle, as you so rightly called it, can I still drink or can they still drink alcohol on a keto diet? <laughs> oh, man, great question. Um, honestly, I think so. Um, and I think it's, like you said, it's about making it a lifestyle. The minute you tell someone, hey, you have to cut out this, 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 and this, you can never have it, it just doesn't become sustainable. Um, so it's finding alternatives. I mean, I love playing around with different recipes and different cocktails and things like that, but it's finding alternatives that make it work. And so... I'm a big fan of red wine. Um, I'd like to have like a glass every, every once in a while, especially like a nice dinner. Um, red wine uh, can actually uh, definitely keep you in ketosis. There's a lot of different wines. There's a, a ton of wine companies now that are coming out. Uh, like one of them is Dry Farm Wines, and they actually advocate two ketogenic diets because they cut all sugar out um, of their wine. So Fantastic. That's an, yeah, that's an incredible resource to have. And then on top of that, 
what I tell people is if you're going out, you're having mixed drinks, um, just make sure you're not having like a soda, like a, like a vodka soda. Like uh, there's other ways to do it. Um, a lot of, a lot of the guys that, that we've worked with in the past, they'll do some alcohol and water and then they'll bring their own little water flavoring to make their own little drinks when they're out to kind of keep it, uh, keeping ketosis. Terrific. Great recommendations for sure. Yeah. Neats on the rocks, you know, water, soda, these things, you know, avoiding those juices and sodas. Um, Mm -hmm. great, great recommendations. Now, what about when people are jumping into this? How about in terms of testing? Do folks need to, you know, be using some urine dipsticks to check if they're in ketosis? Uh, Should they jump in with both feet and go for a blood ketone or breath uh, analyzer? What's your, what's your take there? Yeah, no, another great question. And I think during the initial, uh, phase, if you're just starting out, I like to recommend it, um, testing early on. And the only reason that is because I think it gives someone good feedback and them getting encouraged of seeing, Hey, I peed on this strip and it turned a different color. Like they're going, Hey, it's working. Like at least I know something's going on in my body. It's not necessary by any means, but it's good to kind of just while you're tinkering around, while you're playing with it to kind of get that feedback to figure out, all right, I'm, I'm on the right track. Um, now, nowadays, like I don't, I don't test myself at all. Um, very, very rarely do I test unless I'm like trying to like say, Hey, will this keep me in ketosis or I'm testing out some unique supplement. But after time, over time, after you've been on a ketogenic, uh, diet, you actually don't need to test at all. And, and in fact, we see the people who have been on for the longest, like years, their ketone levels can range so much because they're utilizing them at such different rates that, if you, I, can, I know people that have been on a ketogenic diet for years, and when they pee on a strip, they won't see anything um, compared to someone who's just starting out who might be on it for like a week and a half, and theirs will turn a completely different color. So early on, yes, I think, I think it could be a good tool, um, but it's not something you need to do all the time. For sure, yeah, definitely a nice motivator as well as those initial results that you tend to see as well are two great things to help get people motivated, as you mentioned, which is such a huge thing when people are making some of these changes early on. Uh, now, if we shift gears to hypertrophy, performance, you know, can athletes gain size and strength if they're following a keto diet? Oh, man, and this is, this is what really got us down this, this rabbit hole of studying ketogenic diets. Um, several years ago, we, Jacob and I were at a conference uh, the National Strength and Conditioning Association Conference, and Dr. Jeff Volick, a really good friend of ours, was giving a talk on this very topic. And he was he's one of the first pioneers, him and Dr. Finney, to look at, can you perform on a ketogenic diet? And so he gave a phenomenal presentation, um, but it was all about endurance athletes. And at the end of the presentation, an individual got up at the mic and they said, uh, Dr. Volick, is there any studies that have been done on resistance training? What about like muscle size, like gaining muscle? And he goes, honestly, there, there, there are none. No one's done that yet. And so Doc, Jacob and I looked at each other and we were like, well, we do a lot of resistance training studies. This is really fascinating. We've known about the ketogenic diet. Why don't we do it? Um, so that kind of led us to an, embark on a study um, that we actually published with him and Dr. Dom D'Agostino a couple of years ago. And basically what we found was we took individuals. We had one group that was eating a, like their standard diet. They didn't switch anything up. And we matched them. We had them work with a dietitian to another group who was eating the same amount of protein, same amount of calories, but they just ate a ketogenic diet rather than like the standard American diet. We put them, we adapted them for two weeks, and then we allowed them to train for eight weeks. Hard resistance training program for the next eight weeks worked very closely with a dietitian, monitored their ketone levels to make sure they were compliant. And what we found is that after that 10 weeks, the two weeks of adaptation and the eight weeks of training, after the 10 weeks, the individuals who were on a ketogenic diet were able to gain just as much muscle, um, but lose a little bit more fat than those who were on a standard Ameri- uh, like their standard diet, despite the fact that protein was matched, which is what a lot of people have questions about, and calories were matched. So there seemed to be this advantage for them to be in this unique state. And then a lot of them really enjoyed it and continued on for, for a long period of time. Terrific. And I, I know that for a lot of, you know, bodybuilders, et cetera, this type of technique is definitely something that's been 
readily used. And um, I've also heard that as you train that intensity, they can actually increase the protein intake above that sort of moderate, um, even up to like a gram per a pound. Is there is that something you've seen in the lab at all? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, definitely people who are working out, and because the ketogenic diet is so new, is that a lot of people, there's still this, oh, you need to go 75, 25 percentage. I think it's much more, like there's, there's, it's much more malleable. You can work with it uh, and it's on an individual basis. So like you said, we've seen that some individuals can get their protein up very high um, and still maintain a degree of ketosis because they're training so hard. And since our study was published, there's been others. Uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Rachel Gregory, did a study in CrossFit athletes. And she found the same exact thing. She took CrossFit athletes, matched their protein, matched their calories. And this was in both men and women and found that they were able to gain the same amount of muscle. They lost significantly more body fat and their performance on like the workout of the day, um, both of them incre uh, increase their performance to the same degree. So more and more studies are coming out, kind of confirming that you can perform well, you can gain muscle, lose a significant amount of fat. And like you said, it's, it's, it's so much individual variation that people can tinker and play around with it to find what works for them. That's really interesting because that, that sort of dovetails into my next question around you know team sports and performance where you have you know higher glycolytic demands like in basketball or up here in Canada hockey. Um, you know, can the keto diet still work? And it seems like with the CrossFit results, that would imply uh, yes. Um, would you suggest any other kind of tweaks that people might make if they are kind of engaging in more heavily glycolytic uh, type sports? Yes, uh, and this is a great question. We actually just finished up in another study with a colleague of ours, uh, Jordan Joy, and. He basically did a study where he wanted to look at what happens in that kind of sprinting range versus, like like you said, glycolytic versus a lot of this oxidative stuff. Well, one of the things that we find, if you look at sports, even sports like basketball or these intermittent sports where there's periods of like sprinting, stopping, then sprinting, stopping, a lot of those over time start to kind of turn over to get more oxidative than glycolytic. So we... We, t we did a study where we looked at um, wing gates, which are like very high intensity cycling. And what he did was he looked at 10 wing gate bouts where he had someone go very hard, kind of mimicking like what a sport would be like. Very hard for like 30 seconds, kind of like a shift in hockey. Yep. Very hard. They rested for like a minute and then they would do it again. And they did that 10 times. So, and what he found is early on, the individuals who are on a ketogenic diet, their peak power wasn't as high as those who are on like a, a higher carbohydrate diet, which is what we would expect. Their peak power wasn't as high. But once you got started to get to sprints like seven, eight, nine, it actually reversed. The individuals who are on like a high carbohydrate diet, kind of their peak power started going down. But those who are on a ketogenic diet uh, were significantly higher, um, which kind of mimics that type of intermittent sport. So I definitely think um, there's a lot more we need to do, but it, it kind of lends hand and points to the fact that people who are intermittently sprinting in their sport, soccer, uh, basketball, hockey, there can be some potential during those longer periods. Fantastic. That's really um, interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing more come out there. Um, and of course, as we even look into the keto diet, um, things like fat bombs, intermittent fasting, obviously really popular with sort of the Silicon Valley startup groups, the techies in terms of, you know, brain boosting cognitive benefits. So if we shift gears over to that side of things, uh, can you share any insights on the research front there? Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the new applications are going is when we talk about the neurological effects of the ketogenic diet, that's where I get excited um, more than ever. We can jump into traumatic brain injury, but before we, before we get there, just the cognitive aspects, like you said, these biohackers who are out in California and Silicon Valley are just crushing it by doing things like intermittent fasting, getting their ketone levels up, and they're not eating all the time. They're not worried about food, and most of them are like, oh, man, I have to go eat now rather than where's my snack? I'm, I'm crashing here. Where do I need something else? And so by being able to have this alternative source of energy, these ketones, to fuel the brain and to fuel their bodies, they're able to kind of 
I guess, hack the system, hack their bodies to perform longer and more efficiently than they did when they were on like a super, a carbohydrate based diet. And again, riding that roller coaster of ups and downs. And in terms of exogenous ketones, supplemental ketones, is there a better application there for cognitive function, say if you're at work versus, you know, team sport athletes or endurance athletes? Yeah, absolutely. I think there there is, and there's there's a lot of research that's going into exogenous ketones right now um, that I think is fascinating um, from the cognitive aspect. Uh, we've done studies, um, a bunch of different studies on exogenous ketones, looking at things like reaction time and cognitive tracking capabilities, and found profound increases with uh, just acute supplementation thirty minutes after taking um, exogenous ketones. So. I think that's incredible. And then there's a company called Prove It who's funding a ton of different research, um, which is great to see doing anything from safety studies to reaction time to what happens in individuals who are former athletes that had traumatic brain injury or uh, athletes who have some type of neurological complications. How can you now provide potentially an alternative source of fuel um, not by dietary means necessarily, but by supplementing with that, along with hopefully a low carbohydrate diet, how can you help mitigate a lot of the complications that they're running into? That's phenomenal. And in terms of brain injury, obviously such a hot topic with the you know in the NFL and up here with in Canada again with with hockey and, and the NHL. Um, would it be more on the supplemental side where we would see some some therapeutic benefits with also the dietary intervention, whether it's in the off season, whether it's throughout the season, whether it's post. A career for some of these athletes that could have some benefit? A hundred percent. And this is this is where I think our research is going uh, and where I think it needs to go the most. Uh, I was just talking with Rob Wolf um, the other day at a conference and it's amazing to see. Uh, it's it's sad to see, but it's, it's so shocking to see. There's just a recent publication that came out or an article that talked about NFL, former NFL athletes and they looked at the brains of like 111 athletes and 110 of them had signs of CTE. And that's that's alarming. That is scary to think about. At this level, we're now finally starting to really take a deep dive into the brain and it really starts when these kid when these people are kids and in their youth. And if you think about the compounding uh, contact that it doesn't matter if it's football, if it's hockey, even soccer, um, because you have people who are heading the ball in soccer yep. pretty frequently. Um, all of these things, they start at a young age and it builds up over time. Um, and so what can happen if you potentially have this alternative source of fuel? And my thought is ideally people would get would, would get on board and, and kind of go along with uh, a well-formulated ketogenic diet that, that fit their necessary sport. But it's not a, the world's not always perfect. And, and so if that's not possible, I think in conjunction with exogenous ketones, along with things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I think has an enormous amount of application with that as well, is – you combine the, all three of these things together, like a well-formulated diet, exogenous ketones, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, potentially like before, during, and after any of these games or like you said, in the off-season. I think we can really start to change the way that people view the sport and people recover from the sport and can live a long, thriving life rather than suffering through the, what we call like the life, at, life after the game. Hundred percent. I mean, that's some amazing, amazing stuff coming down the pipeline. So look forward to to keeping our fingers on on what's going on there. Now we've we've covered the weight loss, we've covered the performance. Um, now, if we shift gears over to yourself, you're a busy guy. Some of the insights, you know, how do you start your day? How, are you a coffee guy? Big breakfast? Start the day with some training? What? How does that look? Yeah. So I I like to play around with a lot of different approaches. Right now, um, one of the things I've been doing in the morning is. Uh, coffee. I just do some coffee in the morning um, to kind of get me through. And I usually do, I'm playing around right now with exogenous ketones, probably here in about 30 minutes. And I like that because it kind of allows me to push lunch. And I don't really eat lunch until about two or three o'clock my time. And then I mainly have dinner, maybe seven or eight. So 
I'm, I'm playing with different, uh, quote unquote, intermittent eating windows uh, right now. And so that's kind of how I go about my day to from coffee to exogenous ketones and then have about two meals a day. Terrific. And on the exercise side, you know, with being so busy, are you still carving out as much time to train for yourself? Are you getting more efficient with your training? What are some little hacks that you've done there? Yeah. So I, um, some days I'll do two a days, like in the morning I'll get up and, um, I might hit some, some intervals, do some high intensity interval training, or even just go on a walk and listen to podcasts or catch up on some, some audio books. Uh, and then I usually ha- train now in the afternoon or late e- early evening, um, after everything's kind of wound up. And one of the things that I've switched gears from is I went from being an athlete playing, uh, baseball in college. So I trained that way. And then after that, I was like, Hey, how can I put on as much muscle as humanly possible? So I trained like bodybuilding style for a while. And now I'm, I'm kind of just training for, I call it like longevity and health. Like I go in, um, I have, I have a goal for what I'm trying to accomplish that day, but it's, it's quick. It's I usually try and keep it no longer than 30, 40 minutes, efficient, high intensity. I usually go moderate to high reps. I don't do really train heavy anymore. Uh, my joints just, just can't handle it anymore. So I usually go moderate to high reps and just get in, get out and, uh, get after it. Awesome. Ryan, those are fantastic insights. I appreciate you taking the time out today. Where can people keep up with your work? Where can people pick up the new book and uh, stay connected with you on social media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Facebook, you can add me on Facebook. I love interacting and and, and meeting people there. It's just Ryan Lowry, L-O-W-E-R-Y. And then on Instagram, I've been doing a lot, kind of just trying to educate and disseminate information out there with like infographics and just putting information out there. On Instagram, that's Ryan P. Lowry, L-O-W-E-R-Y. And the book officially launches August 15th, but it's uh, on pre-order now at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing that, that uh, Jacob and I talked about very early on with this book is because there's, such a lot, there, there's, not a lot of, there's a lot of misleading information on the ketogenic diet and there's not a lot of research yet to answer a lot of the questions that even we talked about today – and so with that, all the proceeds that we get as authors from the book, we're actually going to be donating back to ketogenic research, ketogenic education, and nonprofits. And so one of our missions right now is we actually have a study lined up looking at like PTSD. And I think that can be a really intriguing area to kind of help veterans and military combat a lot of the the difficulties they face when coming home. So hopefully because of this, we can get more information out podcasts like your, like, like this and, and all the amazing work that you're doing, get more of this information out and kind of get a lot more of that research to help a lot more people on a larger scale. Phenomenal. 